Ladies and gentlemen, if you could please take your seats. Good morning, Admiral Carter, Admiral Daly, esteemed guests, Brigade Midshipmen. On December 23rd, 1783, just up the street from where we sit now, General George Washington resigned his commission before the Continental Congress. In a now famous painting by John Trumbull that now hangs in the rotunda of the US Capitol building, Washington is seen standing tall in uniform as a ray of light shines down on him, presenting his commission to then uh, President of the Continental Congress, Thomas Mifflin. This symbolic act forever affirmed civilian control over our military. As you know, Washington would later serve as the first president of the United States. These two precedents set by General Washington highlight the important questions about when and how our military leaders should engage in the political arena today. Senior officials debate how to engage to this day. This raised questions of whether or not they should engage at all. This morning's panel will attempt to answer these questions. This panel will be moderated by Mr. Bob Woodward. Bob Woodward is an associate editor at the Washington Post, where he has worked since 1971. He has shared two, in two Pulitzer Prizes, first in 1973 with the coverage of the Watergate scandal with Carl Bernstein, and second in 2002 as the lead reporter for the 9-11 terrorist attacks. He has authored or co-authored over 18 books, all of which have been national nonfiction bestsellers. 12 of those books have been number one national bestsellers. His most recent book, The Last of the President's Men, was published by Simon & Schuster, on October of 2015. Woodward continues to make a lasting impact on the field of journalism. Today, Mr. Woodward will lead our panel in the conversation that spans the lessons learned from their time in uniform, their personal participation in politics, and the challenges faced by officers of today and the future. Thank you, and please welcome our panel. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, there is no seniority today. I got out of the Navy as a lieutenant. <laughs> and so, uh, but I am not going to defer to the senior officers. I, I hope they, uh, that we will have a really active discussion and please interrupt. Please, if you disagree, say so. Uh, and let, let's no one give speeches. Uh, let me introduce everyone. Uh, General Powell, uh, somebody who came into the military through ROTC, uh, actually uh, served two combat tours in Vietnam, was National Security Advisor, which is the key coordinator on national security for the president, and the president in this case was Ronald Reagan. Served four years as chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the number one military advisor to the president, the sec secretary of defense, and the National Security Council. Served four years as secretary of state. One of General Powell's favorite quotes comes from Robert E. Lee, in which Robert E. Lee said, quote, it is well that war is so terrible or we should grow too fond of it. Uh, Admiral Ruffhead uh, is graduated from the Naval Academy here in 1973. Uh, is, is somebody who, uh, I, I, in looking at his biography, there's not a Navy job you didn't have. It's quite astonishing. Two uh, command of two uh, Aegis uh, Navy ships, uh, commandant here at the Naval Academy, commanded the Atlantic Fleet, the Pacific Fleet, and was Chief of Naval Operations for four years. On the end, uh, Vice Admiral uh, Harward uh, retired also. Naval Academy uh, 1979, is that correct, yes, sir? A Navy SEAL. If you read his biography, he worked for all kinds of SEAL teams and then you try to find out what those SEAL teams did, and it's a blank. <laughs> Commanded SEAL Team 3, worked on the National Security Council staff, a counter-terrorist uh, expert, uh, six years commanding troops in Afghanistan and Iraq, De Deputy Commander of 
Central Command under General Mattis, who was now the Secretary of Defense, and turned down the job as National Security Advisor for President Trump. We'll get to why you decided to say no. But let's begin. Uh, G uh, General Powell, uh, uh, essentially, uh, Admiral Mullen was saying that uh, military, retired military officers need to kind of stay out of the political fray. What do you think? I think that's up to the officer. There is nothing wrong with participating in politics once you're out of uniform. Uh, but one little factoid that might be helpful here is that 12 of our presidents were generals. 12 of the 45 were generals beginning with George Washington and going all the way through Dwight David Eisenhower. And we have many members of uh, Congress who are now politicians who came out of the military. And frankly, we're encouraging more and more politicians to be veterans so they can bring that experience into the military or into the Congress. In my, my own case, uh, how I handled this difficult situation of balancing my military experience and my political experience came up when I was National Security Advisor to President Reagan in that I felt it was my obligation as National Security Advisor to coordinate the efforts of the National Security Council uh, staff, uh, but also to do it in a way that I was presenting the President's position to the Congress or to the press, but I was not a political advocate for that position. So I thought that way I could maintain my responsibility to the President and also my responsibility to my service, since I was an active duty officer at that time. It was interesting in that when I was moved up from Deputy National Security Advisor to National Security Advisor, several members of Congress wanted to oppose that confirmation because they didn't think an active duty officer should be National Security Advisor. It turned into something of a, a big fight in the Senate. Uh, and then one of the senators discovered that I had given a quote to the New York Times when I was asked about this. And I said, I believe that the National Security Advisor should not be an active duty military officer, should be a civilian. And when the senator who was objecting to me said, well, did you actually say this? I said, yes. Do you still believe it? Yes, I do. <laughs> but President Reagan doesn't. <laughs> and neither did President Trump. Um, and so, but at the same time, you have to be cautious. And I think Mike Mullen pointed this out that if you have taken on political responsibilities along with your military rank, you have to make sure that you can dismiss or discharge those duties, but at the same time not violate who we are. In my 35 years of military service, I never expressed political opinions. I voted every year because every time I had uh, an opportunity to vote because that's what the military encouraged us to do. But I never identified myself with any political party and I was faithful to the code of an active duty officer. But then when you but retired, as, you said you were Republican. Yeah, that was after I was retired and no longer in the uniform. So, and but what Admiral Mullen is criticizing is, uh, for instance, the so-called revolt of the generals in 2006, where retired senior officers came out and said Rumsfeld should retire or quit or be fired. Is that too far? No, I mean, there's nothing that prevents them from doing that. There is no law against it. There is nothing that says they cannot offer a political opinion. You may object to them doing that, but you can't say that they're not allowed to do it or there is no basis for them to do but, it. But we had Mullen, the revolt of the admirals back in the 40s. Yes, but Admiral Mullen is saying that taints the military. I that don't think it does. I don't think it does. It. Can I add yeah, just yes. an important nuance to what the secretary said? It's interesting to note the National Security Advisor is not a confirmable job. The President doesn't have to talk to Congress or ask anyone except when it's an active duty military member. So when the General took that job, it was now going to be a new and all three and four star positions have to be confirmed by Congress. If, if I had gone in as a retired Admiral, no confirmation, I just went in the job. But the fact that uh, General Powell at the time, now Secretary of Powell, went into that job in uniform, the Congress got a vote on it. Okay, how about the uh, main question here? After you retire, yeah. should you enter the political fray? 
Yeah. Um, You've spoken about this. Yeah, you I have, have spoken strong... about it. And, um, and before I answer your question, one, I'd like to thank the Academy and USNI for this conference. And for the young midshipmen and the young cadets that are here, a very topical, of great interest, something that you need to be aware of. But the most important thing that you have to do when you leave this institution or West Point or your college is to be the best military officer, the best military operator, the best military leader that you can be. That is where your focus needs to be. You still have to be aware of all that's swirling around. Now, my view on uh, retired military officers in politics, I think, uh, is fairly close to what Admiral Mullen talked about. You can jump into elected politics or elective politics. That's your business. You'll be held accountable by the voters, and, and, and that accountability is there. You can elect to serve in an appointed position, as we have today with uh, some uh, retired military officers. Uh, that is a choice that they make, uh, consistent with their beliefs and the philosophy of the administration that they may be going into. And the third area is the active role of retired military officers in what I'll refer to as campaigns. And I think that we have really uh, started to distort the professional ethos of military officers. If we are a profession, if we have an ethos, if we believe in that, then I believe it's an ethos for life. And to become uh, politicized, to participate in campaigns, to get caught up in the endorsements of candidates, not just at the presidential level, but down ballot as well. That happens at the, the uh, candidates running for Senate will come to you as a retired officer. Members of the House will come and, and ask for endorsements. And I think it has become, in recent years, almost a competition. How many candidates have X number of retired admirals and generals, and the other candidate has Y number? And I think that that really begins to distort things. And the farther away the American people become from the American military and the lack of knowledge, when they hear about Admiral so-and-so or General so-and-so, uh, is that an active admiral, retired admiral? What does it mean? And the problem that I see is it begins to bleed down into the active ranks. It taints uh, impressions that civilian leadership may have, as, as Mike Mullen pointed out, as to where are your loyalties? Are you giving professional military advice, or are you falling in line politically, real or imagined. Okay, and uh, I think that's the challenge uh, that we uh, have. Admiral Harwood. Uh, uh, two, uh, I, I just have to fall in with the CNO here exactly right. And number one, first off, we've been at war 17 years now. I, I don't think it's ending. Uh, I, I consider this the age of armed conflict. We're going to be in conflict for years to come, and we have Junior officers, just like you, in 2001, the first kid I put in Afghanistan in uh, October of 2001 was a Naval Academy grad. His father was a retired admiral. He was a JG. He's now a captain. He's done it his whole life. That's what you guys and ladies are going to be doing. So as a CNO, we need you to focus when you leave here to be the best infantrymen in the Army or Marines, the best surface warfare officer, the best pilot able to execute your craft in combat while taking care of your men and women on these billion dollar assets we're going to trust you with. There's nothing more important than that. Uh, going back to the question at hand, uh, I agree with the CNO, Admiral Mullen. It is an ethos. You, you're living it, you're learning it, you're breeding it now, you go out, go out and experience now. Nothing should ever taint that. And that's what this can do. And at the end of the day, though, these are personal choices. Uh, these individuals make, and they'll live with the ramifications of that good or, or not. But I still think we are the most noble profession there is. Uh, um, the greatest accomplishment I ever had was being a part of that. Uh, and how you represent it the rest of your life is the responsibility you have to everyone else who serves. That's the responsibility but, we have if, to if, all of you who Paul, will serve. If, isn't it comforting to the voters to see, oh my God, we've got a candidate who is endorsed and supported actively 
by people who have had experience in the military? I think it is. And um, I spoke at two national conventions, Republican conventions, in 1996 for Bob Dole and in 2004 uh, George W. Bush. And in both instances, I don't think I stepped <coughs> across <coughs> any lines because <coughs> I said why I was supporting a candidate but did not get into any discussion of the opponent. And I felt that I had a responsibility as a former national security advisor, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, to offer my opinion to my fellow citizens about who was going to be the next commander in chief. I share the, the problem that Gary touched on in that it has gotten very ugly and nasty lately, where we have people out there who are retired senior officers who are not only just presenting a political view or endorsing somebody, but doing it in the nastiest possible way that I don't think serves a useful purpose. But Admiral, isn't the remedy here that if officers in the military, whatever level they're serving at, particularly at the high level, do their job well, that uh, I, I was struck with something Admiral Mullen said. He said, it's way too easy to go to war. As a reporter writing about uh, eight presidents from Nixon uh, to Obama, I think that's really true. And it has been made too easy to go to war for lots of reasons, but the antidote is if the military is coming in and being very forceful, like you were when you were chairman of the Joint Chiefs for Bush Sr. in 1990, as I recall, Bush called you in or at a National Security Council meeting and said, now Saddam Hussein, leader of Iraq at the time, has invaded Kuwait and taken over this country. President Bush decided he's not going to let that stand. We're going to do something, and we're going to use the military. And he said to you, how much force will you need? What will you need to succeed? Do you remember what you said? Yeah, I've always been a, an advocate of putting in enough force to get the job done, <clears throat> to get a decisive, a decisive result. And in that case, Norm Schwarzkopf, the commander, and I told the president early on, we have two missions, one, to keep them from coming south into Saudi Arabia, and two, to kick them out of Kuwait if they don't leave as a result of UN sanctions. And I told them it would be 250000 for the first part, <clears throat> and we can guarantee the security of Saudi Arabia and the rest of the nations in the region. And then we probably need another 250000 to kick them out. And so that's 500,000. Right. And we gave him something else. We said it will work. There's no question about this being successful. And he made it clear that that's all he wanted to do. He didn't want to go to Baghdad. He didn't want to get involved in all of those issues. And that's exactly how to play out. And if you go back and look, uh, Admiral, I'm not, I don't recall what you were doing during that war. What you were still in the academy, I think. No, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he was. <laughs> we'll give you some water. Uh, I, some. I was uh, blissfully at sea at the time. <laughs> so, um, but I, you know, I think that one of the challenges that we have, and 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 I believe that this is where the the serving military uh, can press within the bounds of the of the governmental structure. The question that I believe we have not been able to answer well is what do you want it to look like when we're done? And, and I think in the case of General Powell, there was a, that, was, that was the desire of an end state, but I'm not so sure that we um, in the national security and within our political structure have been doing that. Uh, and, and if you don't know what you want it to look like, I think we will continue to be in this state of and this is war. define the mission. And if you look at the first Gulf War, uh, and there was lots of criticism, and quite frankly, uh, uh, reporting on this, I had some criticism of it. But you look back, and it was a model of defined, simple mission where the military came into the commander in chief and said, "Yes, it will succeed." 
We're going to do it in a very short period of time. It's going to be lethal. I mean, God knows how many Iraqi soldiers were killed in, what, 30 days of intensive bombing? A little more, but close to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was uh, the, the war that ended very quickly. I think the initial casualties were 136, and the troops came home. So, you know, what, what we are into now is very nebulous descriptions of what you call end state. What do we want to accomplish? And that's the job of the political leaders, but it's also the job of the military, yeah, isn't let me, it? Let me touch on that. Yes, sir. As chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I'm principal military advisor to the National Security Council, um, and especially to the president. But does that mean I can't give political advice? War is a political act. And whenever I felt that I had a political position to present to my leaders, I would do it. There were a couple of occasions where they thought I went too far out on my skis, as I occasionally say. But I felt uh, Give us an example. Uh, an example is, um, well, in the very beginning, Mr. President, you just want to make sure they don't come south into Saudi Arabia, or do you want to eject them? And some of my colleagues thought you shouldn't even be raising questions like that. But I think that was a, a gut important question to know if we were going to do our job as the military. And so when something like that comes along, I take the risk. Mr. Cheney, my boss at the time, was so understanding of this that if we would go into the Oval Office for a discussion, decision, and Mr. Cheney would present to the president and the gang of eight, as we called ourselves, this is the Defense Department's position. And they'd say, but Colin doesn't quite feel that same way as, we, as I do. So Colin, tell the president what you think. That's the way it ought to work. Uh, the military leadership should not be constrained in what they could say to their political bosses because that's our job. And at the same thing, uh, going back to the original question, once you leave the military and take off your uniform, uh, even though you have to have some standards, as Gary's been talking about, and make sure you don't cross what we consider is acceptable behavior for a retired military officer, at the same time, you are not constrained legally or in any other way from participating in political life. And I think we sometimes have benefited over time by having generals and admirals who retire and then do participate in political life. Uh, the one thing I would yeah. say, and, and it's kind of splitting hairs a little bit, and it's the question of um, w what is political and what is policy? Uh, for example, you know, I still stay active uh, through a think tank, and, and I still have a great interest and passion for things that are going on in Asia. Um, I can talk about the South China Sea or the East China Sea based on my experience and, and offer thoughts and suggestions, but I do not go out and actively campaign to uh, try and sway a lot of public opinion to that point. So I think policy and politics is something that we really need so to it's, define. So it's somewhat a matter of style, isn't it? I, I would say it's, it's uh, there may be some style, but I think um, being able to make recommendations on particular issues, and, and I could care less if a, if, a, if a Democrat wants to listen to me or a Republican wants to listen to me. Admiral. What do you think? Uh, I, I go back to comment the secretary said. You know, he gave his best advice, and, and that's what the National Security Council does. It goes out and gets the best concepts, the best ideas, and debates those and discusses those so they can present the best options to the president. And then as the president mulls those, he has a prerogative to go back and reinforce why this is a compelling. And that's really one of the things we've done where we've made so much progress the last 16 years. We really are a whole of government like we've never been before because that apparatus and the experience we've gained from the 16 years of war have really built those tentacles. Uh, I am a little concerned how that's functioning now. I don't get the sense it's as collaborative as it's been in the past and maybe because it's a new team in place, but in this through Iraq, through Afghanistan, we had not only the best policy, 
but then the politics that went with that could be discussed in those forums. One of the things, and I think this connects to this in a, an important way, uh, a number of years ago, I was having a private breakfast uh, with David Cameron when he was British Prime Minister. And I asked, what do you think of President Obama? And he said, oh, I really like him. He's so smart, but no one's afraid of him. And if you look at the, I did books on Obama, if you look at uh, his national security policy, I think it's fair to say that the Putins of the world and the Assads of the world did not fear President Obama. What's the role of fear from the point of view of the United States military? Should we be actively trying to scare the shit out of people or not? <laughs> no, I, um, I think that um, we should position ourselves and the nation should make the investments uh, that it needs to make so that when the application of force is an option that it's credible, uh, that it is as apparent as the political leadership would like to make it, but it has to be credible, it has to be respected. And, and I think that that's a question uh, that you're asking is not only the capacity and capability of the military, but the will of the political leadership to use it. So I think that... that uh, but, but scaring people has a role no, in like, policy, doesn't it? No, I'd rather... I would not put, put it that way. I think what the world expects of America and what America should always put forward is respect us. The president and the administration and the nation as a whole needs to be respected. They know our military power. They know what we can do. They know what a president can do. Um, and I wouldn't have used uh, Mr. Cameron's words. But what I fear is that if we don't have consistent, coherent policies that people can understand over time, and if we're not building alliances, and if we're not treating every one of the 193 nations in the world as a, something with respect, treat them with respect, and act in that manner, that's where we lose power. That's where we lose influence. Not just because, uh, you know, we got more guns than somebody else. But, but when you said that a president decides to send the fleet as a show of force, or admiral, I mean, just the existence of all these SEAL teams, all this secrecy, all this power, uh, scares the shit out of people, doesn't it? We like that as SEALs, actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty effective. Well, we but don't I, have to brag about it. We can but, just do it. They know they're there. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, but somehow you have to remind people, don't you? I, no? But I, I, along with the respect, I, and fear's not the right word, but people need to understand we're willing to use our force. If you look at the recent strikes against, well, not recent now, yours, Syria for use of chemical warfare, and we struck, we sent a very strong message that we were willing to use force to reinforce that. And ultimately, that led to one of our greatest accomplishment, uh, removal of the mass bulk of chemical and biological weapons Syria had, a huge success. Um, our ability to challenge others, send signals to countries that we're willing to use force to accomplish our ends is an important element of our policy. But as a, as a matter of, of fact, I think the negotiations that President Obama mm. engaged in did get Syria to reduce its chemical weapons. And that strike ordered by President Trump actually was much more symbolic, wasn't it? It was what I'm talking about, where you say, hey, we're here. When the president President Obama put out a red line, and then when the red line was crossed and he didn't act, that caused a lot of loss of respect for the President of the United States. He didn't do what he said he was going to do. And I've always tried to caution presidents, be careful in the spur of the moment throwing out red lines, if I could, because someone's going to call you on it. Chime in on that. And it's not just the focal point of where the action may be. Um, as I mentioned, I 
continue to focus on things Asian and the Syrian strike, the, the opinions and the attitudes and the attention it received in Asia was significant because it was, as was pointed out, a statement, uh, a consequence, and an action. And, and, if you, and if there's no follow through, it tends to weaken uh, this sense of, of where is America and what do they stand for. And where do you think America is now? Um, I would say that in, uh, particularly in, in Asia, and I would uh, go so far as to, to extend that into the, into the Indo-Pacific, as I like to refer to it, and Bob can cover that, you know, the, the Middle East better than I because he lives there. Um, I, I would say that there's great uncertainty, not just, and it's not about military power. My view is that our walking away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership sent a strategic signal that was far greater than any number of battle groups we could have sailed because what it seemed to signal was an American disengagement from the economic engine that's Asia. And so when we talk about strategic effects, it has nothing to do with the military. It was a huge strategic mess. But your judgment stated here publicly has weight because of your experience in the military. Somebody's going to, I mean, I, you could see people, oh, okay, this is a very definitive statement from a retired senior officer, and you're drawing policy conclusions. Now, it may make sense. You, do you agree? Yeah, but, but I don't see why, you know, this isn't, he's not politicizing anything. He's giving his informed judgment based on 30 years of experience. And I think our retired officers should be able to do that without saying you're politicizing and, everything. And without going on and, and, and aligning with one candidate over another based on, on that decision. As I said, I'm willing to offer that opinion to, to any one of any political stripe. That's just my view, my opinion, on a policy issue when not getting involved in the politics of it. But I can't go so far as to say that uh, we can only talk policy if we really have a preference for one candidate over another. <clears throat> and if people want to hear what we say, uh, what we think, then I don't think that should be a barrier to speaking out for the candidate that you think should be the next commander in chief and president of the United States. But I think you have to be careful before you start attacking the others because then it becomes ugly and gross. And well, it really, it really <clears throat> has been there throughout our history. But it really became active when Bill Crow went out and endorsed uh, President Clinton. I was kind of surprised watching that as chairman. And, and <clears throat> to, to set the context of that, Admiral Crow had been <clears throat> chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was your predecessor. Right. And he retired, in fact, declined a, a second appointment, and so you got the job, so he launched your career. And then he goes out and endorses Bill Clinton, who's running against Bush Sr., who was his boss when he was chairman. And that was his right to do so. And he didn't What'd you violate think? Huh? What did I, I was surprised. Yeah. And I thought it was a little awkward. But then after I thought about it some more, <clears throat> said he was expressing his opinion, his political opinion, as well as a policy opinion, because he was supporting what do you the think policies of, that? of my, my view is, again, um, you know, I, I believe that retired military officers should stay out of the endorsing uh, business of candidates. I mean, that's just the way I feel about it, because of the effect that it can have on, on the civilian leadership, uh, perceptions of where they think the active force could be. Is it political? Is it not political? And because of the volume uh, in, in, in noise and in the numbers of retired officers that have come out and elected to identify themselves with one political party or particular candidate, I think it has really amplified the problem to a point where going forward it will be very difficult for the young leaders uh, to be viewed as apolitical as they're going through their military careers. That's my view. But in the case of Admiral Crow's endorsement of Bill Clinton, uh, Clinton said it really helped him get elected because yes, there was not a long line <laughs> of retired uh, officers who were endorsing Bill Clinton, the sure. notorious yeah. draft dodger. Right. 
So it, it, it had a tremendous uh, impact. Right. And then uh, Clinton appointed Admiral Crow ambassador to London, and people thought that's kind of a payoff. And, but as Admiral Mullen said here, which I think was very important, there's all this activity <coughs> by retired officers, and he said, but it really hasn't made any difference, has it? Uh, I think it, the only difference it has made is, is has called into question the political leanings of the U.S. military. I think that has been the effect. And but, what people believe the military stands for and, and what their political leanings would be, I think that has been the effect. But I wonder whether the real issue isn't uh, the impact on junior officers. Uh, and someone has posed the question, so suppose you're leader, your general retires and comes out and makes some sort of statement or for a candidate or against the Secretary of Defense, and the junior officer is going to think, gee, did that officer, my boss, feel that way when I was fighting for him in Iraq? Troubling, Admiral? Uh Again, it, the circumstances to each situation makes it hard to set a general template, but I do agree, agree that there are ramifications to the active duty force that have to be taken into consideration. But each situation and each individual finds themselves in very unique positions at times in histories that pre presents dilemma. I'm, I, you guys don't, may not remember this, but everybody applauded, uh, and, and that's why I'm so glad to be on this panel with my shipmate here, that so we're proud of, we were able to elect an African American to be our first president. I was convinced the gentleman sitting to your left had that option available to him, and could have been and one of our best, but had he chosen to do that. Uh, so that's one of those unique times in history and place that put him in that position, just like the, the choices I had. So I hate to be template, but I do think each officer has an obligation when he finds himself in this position to understand, think, and evaluate the impact it's going to have on our profession. And, and do we, do we, okay, so to your question earlier, I think it's important that the officer really consider why they're being asked do something. And are they being used? Or is it legitimate and genuine? Oh, suppose they're volunteering. Suppose they run down to the candidate. There can be a lot of motivations why someone may choose to do that. And um, Admiral Mullen suggested some of it is people are making money on this. That ain't good. And they make more money going into business as on a board of a defense <laughs> contractor, uh, which we see a lot of. That's another subject we could discuss, but um, why did you point your <laughs> finger? You know why I pointed my finger. <laughs> yeah, why did you? Yeah, was that a gesture of affection or hostility? <laughs> okay, I've got to insert a factoid here that I didn't intend to use. In the last election, Mr. Trump got 324 votes in Electoral College, and uh, Mrs. Clinton got 220 something. Who came in third? You? Write-ins? I was third. Oh, 11 people wrote your name in? <laughs> <laughs> this is my story, not write-in. I got three electoral votes. Oh, you did? Yes, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I got three electoral votes from the state of Washington because those electors did not want to support the candidate that they were instructed to support. So the three of them wrote my name in. I read about it in the Washington Post. Obviously, you didn't. <laughs> um, but here's, here's the fun. When I read about it... It was I, not on the front page, by the way. <laughs> it was on B-38. Well, I don't care what page it was on, but I found it, and I said, good Lord, what does this mean? 
And um, uh, so I had to now study the issue, and it turns out that uh, the Twelfth Amendment to the Constitution says that if no candidate has received more than 270 votes, and therefore there is no winner, the issue then goes to the House of Representatives. And when it gets to the House of Representatives, what they have to do is look at the top three candidates <laughs> and make a choice. So I came that close, Bob. That's what I pointed to. You know, we all have our illusions, don't we? <laughs> now, but, but tell us, because this is important. You were poised in uh, the mid 1990s. Uh, your uh, memoir came out, uh, which was a giant bestseller. And by the way, I want to point out in that memoir, you were called the, you noted you were called the reluctant warrior. I always have been. And you answered that with one sentence, one word, guilty. Guilty. Yeah, I, I'm... I See, think that's what's so important in all of this. My, my upbringing and two years in Vietnam and lots of other things that I did brought me to the point where we should make every effort we possibly can to avoid a war. And that's what diplomacy is all about. That's what political action is all about. But if and when that war cannot be avoided and we have to fight it, then fight it for a decisive win. Don't waste time, get it over with, but make sure you have a clear political objective. I think the question that was raised earlier with my colleagues is, do we have clear political objectives for all the wars we're in this morning? Uh, three special forces guys were killed in Niger. I didn't even know we were doing anything there. Um, and one, one element in all of this that, that has to be brought into it is that Congress has a responsibility to give us guidance in these matters, and Congress is the one who's supposed to be making these decisions as to whether or not we're gonna go into combat or not. And right now, John McCain has put a hold on all Defense Department nominations until the administration gives him a better explanation of what we're doing in Afghanistan with another 300, 3,000 or 3,500 troops. But to, just to square the circle between what Gary and I have been saying, I think it comes down to each of us has to make our own judgment as to whether or not we are violating the person we are and the history we have as professional officers when we enter into a political debate or give a political position or support a candidate. And there's nothing against us doing it, but I think Gary is right that we have to make sure we're not communicating to our fellow officers junior to us or to the American people that we're nothing but a political hack and we'll do anything for an election. I would also say that I think this increasing number of, uh, of retired senior officers that are playing in the political game, uh, the noise that accompanies it is, is, is masking uh, the need for uh, a discussion and a debate about the military direction of the country uh, the security uh, interests that we have, and it's that, you know, I'm, a, I'm stronger on security because I have 98 generals and admirals and you only have 77, so I'm stronger, it has nothing to do with the policies that that candidate may be espousing. And I think that, 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 that we have, because of the information space in which we live, really masked the need for a serious discussion about the strategic direction of the country, the investments the country should make, what our strategic objectives are, and have that discussion. And, and I couldn't agree more. You know, we tend to focus on the executive branch uh, uh, to do this. Uh, Congress uh, has a lot to do in shaping the direction. Yes, but uh, as commander in chief, the president can employ the force as he wants. And uh, even the, I remember talking to a bunch of academics 10 years ago when, uh, or more when Bush was president, George W. And I was saying, you know, really, we've not had a declared war since World War II, and I think we've had some since then. It's because the, the presidents decide on war. They would not hear of it. And I said, look, the presidents have this authority and power, and they wouldn't accept it. I said, look, George W. Bush, could invade Mexico 
tomorrow. And somebody stood up in the back, very troubled, and said, don't give him any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> but the president can do that. And, I agree. I, I, you know, this is, this is the system that we have uh, set up. And I think now, as we face lots of national security dilemmas, there is much discussion and worry about how do we decide to go to war? The president can do that, but there's a PS. Only if the Congress does not insert itself and object to what the president's doing. Well, they can, the mm -hmm. only way they the can object the is, is withdraw funds, mm -hmm. money. And once the troops are, and you know, everyone's engaged, the Congress is not going to come along and say, oh, let's take away the money for the bullets and food. But they can. They, they have yeah. the So to say that the president can do anything he wants, I mean, the Constitution has made it clear. Uh, that this is really a decision to be made by the Commander-in-Chief, but also the Congress has a role. The War Powers Act is relevant in this as well. With all the uh, senior officers here, former officers, I want to ask the question because it touches on this issue of what's the relation with the political leaders. In all of your years of service, was there a moment where you almost resigned? where you had moral discomfort about what was going on either in your command uh, or nationally. Uh, that ever happened, and how did you sort that out, Admiral? No. Never, never, never. thought about it, Admiral? No, I, I had a, a, a situation when I was a young flag officer that um, there's I, no such thing as yeah, a young right, flag right. officer. Everything's <laughs> relative. Um, and and um, was being mustered up in Washington for a decision that I had made. And when I left uh, my home that morning, my wife asked me, uh, how do you think it's going to go? I said, uh, What was I, the issue specifically? It, it dealt, quite frankly, it was something uh, that occurred while I was the commandant at the Naval Academy. And, and I made the comment to my wife, I said, uh, I, I will either prevail or we're going to go home. That's what I told her when I walked out of the house. Board the midshipman with the details. What was the issue? <laughs> no, it, it dealt with some judgments that I was making with regard to some uh, disciplinary cases at the Naval Academy that were politically awkward. Um, and my view was that I believed I had made the right decisions in the best interest of the institution and the best interest of the young men and women who were here. And, and I wasn't going to bend on that and I was willing to go home if that was the case. General? No, um, I haven't. And I, I think you, you resign when you can't honestly and faithfully carry out the orders of the President of the United States because you think they're incorrect and you have to leave the party. People have often said, well, why didn't I do something uh, on the second Gulf War? Um, and the answer is I was never Morally Explain what the context. You were Secretary context of was State. It, it's, a, it's in August of uh, 2002. Um, drums are beating to do something about Iraq and their weapons of mass destruction. And I went to see the President and made it clear to him that I thought you ought to try to solve this peacefully. Because if we have to invade Iraq, we can do that. We can take out the government. Then we become the government. If, if you break, you it, break you it, it, you own it. That's, that a reporter from the Washington Post put that in my mouth. I didn't really say that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Washington and, Post. And, and I did, <laughs> but that was the general idea. That was the idea. essence of it, yeah. Well, right. the trouble with that is uh, it, it, the pottery barn got mad <laughs> that we use their thing. And they, we do not charge you if you break it. You don't own yeah. it. Right. And so I had to apologize to the pottery barn. Um, but they got more advertising benefit out of that statement <laughs> right. than anything they've ever done yeah. for yeah. real advertising. But what I said to the president is, the offended party here is the United Nations, not just us. Take it to the UN and try to solve it peacefully. President Bush did that. And not everybody in the, in the government agreed, or in the administration agreed, but he did that. And we gave uh, Saddam Hussein a chance to get out of jail if he would totally lay out what he had and what he'd been doing. Um, and we gave him time to do that. And he didn't do that. Uh, and so then the next thing that came about was when 
uh, the president had to make a decision. Should he go to war or should he keep playing this UN game out, which is getting us nowhere? And he decided that war was not necessary and he told us all. And um, people said to me, well, he didn't keep the diplomatic thing going. Why didn't you leave at that point? Because I told him to do the diplomatic thing. And when he decided as the commander in chief, the president of the United States of America, that we're sti we were still at risk and he had to take military action. And he told me that and he asked would I support him. I said, yes, I would. I asked you to go down this road, but I knew that the road would branch at some point. And, and your line on that, if I'm not correct, was presidents decide whether to go to war, not secretaries of state. Absolutely. And do you, as you look back on that now from this vantage, uh, because even the I mean, all kinds of people acknowledge the Iraq war uh, probably was a mistake. It's certainly hard to be enthusiastic about it. Do you wish you'd done more? I did everything I could at the time with the information and the knowledge that I had. If there was a mistake in the Iraq war, the second one, it was in its execution. Uh, I think it could have been handled much differently with respect to the execution of the conflict. The disbanding of the Iraqi army was a terrible mistake, and uh, causing the Ba'ath Party to fire everybody down to school teachers was a mistake, and not recognizing an insurgency when an insurgency was right before our eyes was a mistake. I think if that had been handled differently, uh, the view of the situation would be different than it is in some places now. But keep in mind, Saddam Hussein is gone. Um, there were no weapons of mass destruction, never were, but we didn't know that at the time, but we know it now for sure. And also, Iraq has a government that has been voted in, and whether they make a success of it or not is up to the Iraqis. What do you think of the Iraq war, Admiral? Um, I, I agree with, uh, with General Powell. I think that there were steps that were taken, and having grown up in that part of the world, um, I think the disbanding of the army and... Um, the Iraqi army. The, the Iraqi army. Um, because I think we've seen in history that in many regimes, such as, uh, as Iraq was at the time, that there are people that may be in the military, may be affiliate, affiliated with the leading political party, and, and they are there because uh, it's in their personal best interest to stay alive that way. And so I think that we didn't have a good appreciation of what that really meant the power structure that, uh, that it would have provided and the influence it would have provided going forward. So I think that was a huge, uh, huge mistake. Admiral? Uh, I have a little different take on it. And, and uh, President Bush, I remember one of the last things he did while he was in office, flew down to Norfolk to commission the USS Bush with his father. And uh, after the event, we got on a helicopter and we flew over to Lil Creek. He wanted to see the seals as one of his last events, which was quite the crew. Condoleezza Rice came with him, uh, Vice President came with him, and he was very colorful. I'd never seen the President use the number of four letter words I'd ever heard him use, but he was very, you guys are the best who killed us. But he made this very interesting comment. He said, Look, my father fought a very ideological enemy. Uh, and now they're one of the great economic powerhouses in the world and one of our great allies. And he was talking about Japan. And as I looked at what happened after Iraq, we were positioned in the region like no other time in our history. Uh, at the, the bulk of the war, we were up to 268,000 troops in the region. And, and on 9-11, we only had 15,000 in the region uh, and most of those were on two carriers, 5,000 each there. So what it had accomplished had placing us in the region in a manner we had never been before to influence the region, much like we had done in Asia, much like we had been in, in Europe, where we were committed and in the region for 30, 40, 50 years to ensure it could mature in, under stable conditions and help influence it. So when you look at the decision to shift to the Pacific in 2010, and we eviscerated that presence, we removed it, we saw what happened. So, and I think this new strategy moves back in that direction where this foreign presence 
is essential to shaping and influence the region to, to allow it to mature in a, a, uh, in a fashion that provides stability and a future for the people. And so I'm not sure if that strategy was intended, but I think it would have worked. Uh, and now we're going to have to wait and see how it plays out. But we saw what happened when we left, when we created, left this vacuum, what happened. So I'm a, a big fan of presence and influence through presence. One, one, one PS. Sir. The president was led to believe that the Iraqi army would be kept intact as a structure so it could be refilled. We dropped leaflets on them telling them, don't fire, don't shoot us. We're going to come in and, and reconstruct the Iraqi army. Um, so that's what the plan was from the Pentagon. It was briefed to the president three times before the war. And same thing with the Ba'ath Party. And then suddenly a decision was made. It's an example of the, the system not working like it's supposed to. Um, the first time I heard that the Iraqi army was being disbanded, I had read it in the newspaper, the morning of the action. And that's when the president discovered it. And I think if, because we were, we were counting on the Iraqi army to give us the security we needed in the cities. Uh, and they would have been better able to do it than, say, the 82nd Airborne or anybody else could have done it. But it didn't happen. And so one of, also one of the lessons in this for people who are midshipmen who may sometimes have your job or your job or your job is the first Gulf War, 1991, it was not done on the cheap. In fact, it was done, send all the force, maybe even more force than you need because the, your line was we want decisive force but we want overwhelming force. We want to guarantee we will win. The second Iraq war in uh, 2003, and I wrote a number of books on this, was done on the cheap. Comparatively, Secretary Rumsfeld was in there in those meetings, and I've talked to everyone, you, Rumsfeld, Bush about this, and he kept wanting to get the number down. And so, by doing it on the cheap, a, an immense price was paid. There was an expectation that the citizens of Iraq would rise up and bless this invasion. Yes. That's not what they did. Yeah. That and was, uh, we, we misunderstood the tension that exists between Shias and Sunnis. And when that gap was opened, then the insurgency really caught, caught fire. Okay. And as we're talking about all of this, I'd like to hear from each of you on the, the question because the midshipmen here are going to go uh, into, uh, you know, they're either going to become pilots or marines or surface war warfare or submariners. Uh, in all of your years, what's the biggest, most important leadership lesson you saw, particularly as a junior officer or, you know, at any point, start with you, Admiral. What's the, what's the leadership lesson that you internalized experience that lives with you? Very simple. Uh, your obligation to those men and women who serve for you and to our country you, of taking care of theirs and our country's interest. Uh, nothing more important than you do as young leaders. But suppose they're not the same. Suppose, oh, let me, and they often let, aren't. Let me tell you they're not the same. Let me tell you about young, one of these kids who go, go out to be buds here. And you're going to get through and you're going to show up at that team ready to be a leader. And you're going to be in a SEAL platoon and your master chief has five bronze stars, probably a purple heart, a silver star. Most of your petty officers have that same sort of combat experience. What do you do as a leader to support them? What is your role as a leader in that type of a... So you're right. It's much different than any time of our history that's going to make their jobs hard. How they earn their respect, how they use their position to take care of those people, meet our mission, and do what our country needs to do. No, and I would agree, and I would say that, you know, we talk about taking care of your people, but taking care of your people, in my mind, 
is making sure that they are ready, trained, and prepared to take on the missions that they're going to be given. Uh, all too often, a young officer can fall into the trap of, of, of making things comfortable. Uh, but the most important thing is, how do you condition those who you lead? How do you learn from uh, the experience that, that you have uh, following you, but never losing sight of the fact that you are accountable for getting that job done? And, and how you approach it, how you sense uh, the needs, the demands, uh, the requirements of those you lead is, is something that I believe uh, is the most important thing that you'll do. I certainly agree with both of them, and uh, leadership is all about followership and followers. But there's one Lincoln story that I have used for many, many years. In the early days of the Civil War, President Lincoln used to like to get away from uh, the White House and go up to where it was cooler in the northern part of Washington, up by the old soldier's home, and there was also a telegraph office there. So he could sit there and uh, see the bulletins coming in from the battlefield. And he's there one night, and suddenly uh, the telegraph operator really has a message coming in, a fast one, an important one. So he takes it down, he writes it out, he turns to the president and says, Mr. President, I'm sorry, it's, it's more bad news, but a Confederate detachment just attacked a Union installation out by Fairfax County, and they captured a Brigadier General and 100 horses. <laughs> and Lincoln looks down and thinks about it a while, and then he suddenly says, hate to lose 100 horses. <laughs> and the operator said, well, what about the Brigadier General? He said, I can make a Brigadier General in five minutes. It's hard to replace 100 horses. <laughs> that was given to me the day I was promoted to Brigadier General. <laughs> and it has been on a wall next to me for the last almost 30 years now. And what it says is, it's the horses that count, it's the troops that count, it's the seals that count, it's the sailors that count. We leaders are privileged to be given the opportunity to lead these young men and women, and that is our principal responsibility, and to make sure that we are accomplishing whatever our superiors have asked us to do. But it all comes down to the horses, the people who are standing watch, the young infantrymen going up a hill, a crew member taking care of an F-16 that's about to take off. And so that's really been my major lesson, and I, I didn't learn this as chairman, I learned this when I was a lieutenant. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the importance of the troops and the importance of making sure that you create an environment of trust and respect within every organization that you're responsible for. There is the Ken Burns documentary uh, about Vietnam, and uh, you served in Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam is a metaphor for lots in this country. What's the main lesson of Vietnam that young people who are here at the academy should take away, Admiral? Well, uh, it, it was, real, in my mind, the national consciousness of the United States in conflict. And that's playing out today because the American people have supported the military in unprecedented ways. And most importantly, and one I worry about, and this is back to my comments earlier about this enduring conflict where we've been at war 17 years now, and we don't know the ramifications that's going to have on the people who have served. We're just coming to grips with that. So Vietnam, to me, because World War II, I never heard issues or stories about how the population came back in and assimilated. I read Brokaw's book, and it talked about what they did to build the nation. We never heard any of that about Korea. Vietnam changed all that. The protesting really built a national consciousness in the vote of the American people on a daily basis of how we're involved in conflict. In the last 17 years, yeah. unprecedented now, I, support. I think, I think Vietnam, but, but going back and studying history of all of our conflicts, and because we're a democracy, understanding what the American people believe about what the nation is doing militarily, I think is hugely important. And so. I encourage the young uh, people here to, to really make a point of going back in history. You know, that when you look at what was going on in the United States during World War II, particularly toward the end, uh, it's very easy to be captured by the image of, of the great victories. But there was social strife that was taking place within the United States 
Um, it was even, you know, during the war, and General Powell I, I could speak uh, more directly to it, the, the tensions that existed among society, segments of society, it was not pretty. Um, Why, though? Because lots of people didn't think it was a necessary war. Right. But, but my point is that I think it's important for young leaders to pay attention to what the mood of the nation is. And I think we're getting a little bit of a disconnect kind of coming back on the topic again. You know, some of the polls that exist today is we need to do more about ISIS, we need to fight more. And then the question is asked, will you go? Well, not really. And so I think that we uh, really need to think about that and think about the mood of the country, the attitudes of the country as, as we think about the application of military. Force. General Powell. I first went to Vietnam 55 years ago as a young advisor junior captain off in the weeds along the Laotian border and felt very good about it. We were there to stop communism. We were there to help this democratic government survive. And we all were really committed to the mission that President Kennedy had given to us advisors then. But by the end of that year, when I came home, I was starting to feel somewhat disillusioned that maybe we hadn't analyzed this properly. And when I went back six years, five, six years later, um, it was clear that we were not winning the war. Uh, they were in it for everything it might require. They were going to fight it to the last uh, Vietnamese soldier in the north, and we weren't. And the country had realized this by now, America. And we were starting to find a way out of it, whereas the North Vietnamese were just doubling down. They were going to beat us. And what I felt at the end of that second year was that this was not successful. We have to get out. And Nixon came in <clears throat> to get us out. <clears throat> I voted for him in 68, thinking he would get us out. It took a while. <laughs> um, but the point that I want to make on this one, and it really relates a little bit to the, the current wars we're in now, to include, say, the, the second Gulf War, is we mistook the strategies. We thought we were fighting against communists, but they were just fighting to be nationalist, to regain control of all of Vietnam. So they were communists, yes, and they, yes, and they still are, but that's not what was driving them. It was their desire to unify their country that was driving them. And in recent places that we are in now, um, the Congress is now starting to demand what exactly is the outcome? What do we hope to, what are we doing? And the answer is not that clear in a number of the places, not just Iraq and Afghanistan. We're all over the place. Yep. Um, and we sometimes are involved, as was mentioned earlier, we're committed in all of these places. But when you look at Asia, China is not fighting anybody anywhere. China has got a vision and a strategy of what it's going to do in Asia. Dropping out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership was a, was a mistake, trying to move right in, and not joining the development bank that China had started was another mistake. And so China's just merrily going along its way. One of the problems we have right now in strategic thinking here in the United States, it's been too militarized in the sense that we're always looking for enemies to fight. Um, and we've even said this in some of our doctrinal work, things coming out of the Pentagon. China, uh, Iraq, China Iran, North Korea and Russia, uh, and those are even being called now our enemies. Do, do, it's not going to work. Do you, each of you, sen I, I sense as a reporter in Washington, there is a, a war <clears throat> fever almost about North Korea, a, a sense that, ah, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll act, we'll do something, we'll solve a problem with military action and, uh, that it is, it, I think, too many people, it's almost poisonous. It's almost like, wait a minute, another war? Are we going to do this? Do you sense that in Washington, Admiral? I, I would not put it in such stark terms, but I think the, you know, the big question for us is, you know, what do we want Asia to look like? And right now, I think we put our paintbrushes away <clears throat> And as Colin said, the Chinese are merrily painting the, the, the scene that they would like. And, and I think that we have to step back and strategically look at what do we want the region to be, what do we want our role to be in it, 
and it's not just but, a military but there's, dimension. Uh, it, well, my experience yeah. is, go ahead, sir. Uh, North Korea, I think the reason they've developed nuclear weapons is because they're, they've always been afraid of us, and it's a deterrent to us. But whenever I hear that, well, you know, look, they're firing rockets, and they're going to blow up a corner of San Francisco or Guam. I can't bring myself to that conclusion. One, what strategic advantage would North Korea obtain by blowing up a neighborhood in San Francisco, killing 10,000 Americans? What, what strategic advantage would they get with the certain knowledge they'll be destroyed the next day? And I used to testify before Congress when I was chairman, we will destroy Pyongyang the next day. And so I don't see that as something they would do. They're very logical within a crazy system. Yeah, and, then, and that's the question. Yeah, are they logical yeah. yes. or how logical? Look how logical they are. They've been there for 69 years with this regime, and, and they're doing fine. They're still there. And um, China would never let them do it anyway. China doesn't want to see a war in Northeast Asia. That, that's supported by some of the secret <laughs> intelligence uh, I'm doing a book on you Trump have, now. You may have access to yeah, secret intelligence. We're well, <laughs> ne never enough. Uh, and uh, but, but and that just, is, they well, ask the question, what does North Korean leader Kim Jong-un want? And the answer comes back, very interesting, said he wants uh, respect, engagement, and normalization. No kidding. Most, oh, of, all, but that, but most that, of all, he wants the survival of his regime. Yes, yeah. And the one thing that would bring his regime down instantly is the use of a nuclear weapon. Okay, but that's not a guarantee he won't you do it. That's the, that's the problem President Trump and yeah. his national security And the way I would handle facing. it is I would keep pushing diplomatically and politically to see if we cannot find a way out of this. And I would also not empower him by overreacting every time he shoots a missile. So if he President shoots a missile that costs one hundred thousand dollars, and we spend ten million dollars moving aircraft carriers and airplanes around. Okay, that's suppose President Trump came to you, General Powell, and said, "I have a letter I want you to deliver to Kim Jong Un on my behalf, and they've agreed they will meet with you. He will meet with you, and you can turn this letter in, and it's it's a diplomatic opening." Seeking. Would you do it? I don't think I'll ever be asked to deliver such a letter. But if the president asked me to do something like that, I'd have to consider it. I'd have to read the letter to see what it is we're proposing, and it's not just an air ball. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and, and I would agree, and I don't Trust have the Trust but verify, intel that you right? Have. You got it. <laughs> Pardon? Would you go? I don't have the intel that you have, so I'd have to see what the letter <laughs> okay. says. Admiral, would you go? I don't trust but verify okay. is the same strategy. <laughs> Tell us real briefly, and we'll do some questions uh, from the midshipmen in the audience. Why did you decline what I guess was an offer to be the national security advisor for President Trump? No, that's the first time I've been asked that in a public forum, by the way. And as you all know, the press gave a myriad of reasons why I uh, did or did not all of it. I don't know where they got any of it from, and they attributed some technical terms to me also that I commonly use, but not, did not use in that uh, uh, instance. So now you can set the record straight. Why? Um, well, that's it, it is one, as you can well imagine, very difficult question. Uh, and my, my naval career was a little unusual in that uh, I was one of those guys kept, that kept in the call in the middle of the night and you left for a year, six months at a time. And my last time for two years. So my family played a pretty big uh, burden for all that. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, you weighed all the pros and cons. I was even trying to put teams together at all. Um, I made a commitment to my wife the day I retired. Okay, honey, it's your call now. And the first thing she did was went out and bought most expensive house, I think, known on this planet, uh, which I'm still playing for. But my wife did not want me to do it. And so uh, with all the pros and cons, that weighed out very heavily. And that's why I, I struck by um, the secretary there. I know when he was considering running for president, that weighed very heavily on his mind as well. Is that correct? Yeah, I didn't want to do it, and neither did my wife. So it was 100%. Um, she had given up a lot 
uh, in the 30 odd years we had been married at that point, and now 55 years. But we just didn't feel it was the right thing for us. And I never woke up a single morning during that period of consideration where I thought this was the right thing for me or I felt in my stomach that this is something I could do. Um, people have said, well, was it because your wife didn't want you to do it? I said, that's for sure. Um, but the reality is it was 100%. Neither one of us wanted to. But going back to what the Admiral just said, if I had wanted to do it and she didn't want to do it, we wouldn't have done it. She had sacrificed so much at that point that I could not have asked that of her or of the children. But the reality is, I think his answer is the same as mine. We didn't want to do it. We didn't think it was the right thing for us. Can I, and Bob, can I make just sure. one comment? And it's because I'm struck by all the mids, the cadets and all here. The value of you guys are going to graduate from the Naval Academy at West Point. They're going to go in and start serving. And the longer we have you, the more valuable we become to you. There's an easy saying at Bud's when you come out of SEAL training, the only easy day was yesterday. And it's so true because you're going to get to that five-year point in your career where, oh, maybe I don't, you know, maybe I'm going to leave. Well, you're going to get that 12 years. You're going to get married. You're going to have kids. I pray we keep all of you 30 years in the service because the longer you're with us, the more valuable you are and the greater impact you have on community. But, but it comes with a very, very heavy price. And you won't realize that until you live it, unfortunately. Uh, so so uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, and and uh, we have microphones here. Uh, if you just raise your hand and uh, you direct your question to uh, any of the, to the general or the admirals, or, or just make it general. Uh, go ahead. Good morning. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Carlos Rosa, a recently returned Olmsted Scholar from Lyon, France. And my question is for the panel. Clausewitz stated that the war is fought for a political objective, and if the cost of achieving that objective exceeds its value, it should be abandoned. I believe that we are living in an era where the political cost of using force is so negligible that the threshold for intervention is too low. Kant argued that in a democracy, they're reluctant to go to war because the citizens are the ones who bear the cost of the fight, whether it's through the actual fighting or through taxation. However, with less than 1% of the American population serving in an all-volunteer force and the defense budget that hasn't really vacillated too much in the last 10 years, are we losing touch with that cost? And how do we fight back against the short political horizon of our officials where the election cycle influences the ability to play the long game and avoid the pitfalls of sequential decision making and the unintended consequences of involvement in internationalized interest state disputes. Okay, who wants to answer that simple oh, question? Go. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna push it off to Pete Daly. I, I think you've just picked the topic for next year. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I really do think that um, you know, this, the, the topic of today is one dimension of what I believe the, the, the nation should be talking about. And that is, what is the role of the military? How has the all-volunteer force changed the, the nature of the country's willingness to uh, apply force when required? Uh, and I think it's a very real discussion that has to take place. Okay, cool. Over here, sir. Sir, uh, Luke Kelvington, Columbia class requirements officer. I have a question. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you stated that it's our privilege to influence our, our sailors, our Marines, uh, the, those that are under us. We train the horses. So what role do we have with respect to our influence when it comes to politics? Uh, Admiral Ruffhead, you noted uh, the um, amount of information that we can put out there, Facebook, you know, we can put bumper stickers on our car. Is it okay for the ensign? Is it okay for the captain where all the sailors walk right past the captain's car? We wouldn't expect Admiral Richardson to have a Pence Trump bumper sticker on his car. So where in that grayness, where do we influence our sailors and Marines with respect to politics? You want to start again? It's directed at you. I think. He said, Mr. Secretary, you're the only one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 
I think that one has to be careful. I, the reason I'm hesitating is that only once in my career did I ever put a political bumper sticker on. And it was all the way with LBJ in 1964. <laughs> and frankly, I had come back from Vietnam. Country was in turmoil on race relations. I'd left my wife in Birmingham, Alabama during those horrible years of 1962 to 63. And um, I'd been thrown out of a restaurant in Columbus, Georgia, even though I'd just come back from Vietnam. I was thrown out because I was black and it wasn't inside. I knew I couldn't go inside. They wouldn't serve me at the counter. And so I felt, you know, pretty bad about all of that. And then Lyndon Johnson signed the Accommodations Act of 1964, July. And I was very supportive of that, supportive of him. And I would never, never did it any other time because I thought it was inappropriate to show that. And of course, back then I was just a captain. Um, uh, as I got more senior, I definitely would not show that kind of political preference. But at that time, and I didn't speak about it in my, in my unit, it was just a bumper sticker I had on, which was noted by a, an Alabama state trooper in Sylacauga, Alabama one night. <laughs> Not, well, he was a good guy. It was a, it was a Volkswagen with a New York license plate and an all the way LBJ <laughs> sticker on it. <laughs> and he said, boy, you need to get out of here as fast as you can, <laughs> which I did. <laughs> But no, I, th I think you're, you're onto something, and, and Gary will talk to it, but I think that we should, not, we should not encourage our troops to put this kind of advertising on their vehicles or places like that, or in their lockers or whatever. And this is especially the case with senior officers. I don't know that if there's a legal way to tell them not to do that, and I'm not gonna get, in, get into that, but I think it ought to be discouraged. And I think, it's, if I could, it's become much more complex because of the social media world in which you live in. Those are the new bumper stickers in my mind, and it can be as innocent as you reposting something that somebody said. So, I mean, this is really a, a, a tough issue to take on, but I really believe, again, it comes back to the, the professional ethos and, and, and keeping uh, the military distant from politics. Uh, but it's going to be harder for, for you and subsequent generations to do because it's all out there. Up here, sir. Good morning, gentlemen. Mitch Iveson, the George Washington University. Uh, my question is for the entire panel. Uh, I distinctly remember that President Trump was given a Purple Heart during his campaign. I was wondering your thoughts on this and if this is proper participation. He what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, somebody gave, gave him, a, him purple a purple heart. Oh, somebody yeah. turned their purple yeah. heart over to him. Yeah. Yes, sir. Right. That was a decision made by the individual. I don't. I don't have any other comment on it. I, uh, Admiral. Hey, Bob, I, I want to go back. I'm sorry. Uh, someone given him a person, but I want to go back one other on that last question, just because we focused on politics inside the ranks and all. It's broader than that, and this is something I think our leaders need to. You're a, a tactical or operational unit, running a, a unit, you're focused on professionalism. There are going to be a lot of people who want to interject politics and other agendas into that ethos and into that ecosystem. I remember, uh, and I won't say names, but we had a problem in the military about 10 or 15 years ago, an insurance company that infiltrated the ranks and became Guy Sona, and it ended up in Bob Harward's plan, uh, idea almost being a scam because they were taking 50% front load of, of these kids' money. So it's not just politics you have to be sensitive. There's a lot of people who are gonna try to come into our community, leverage it for political gains, economic gains. So as leaders, that's really something you need to be <clears throat> focused at and have those discussions on because it's more important than just politics. This will be the sure. last, last question. Yeah, last question. Okay, you. Yes. This morning, uh, Matt McMullen made the comment about wanting people who can unite versus people who divide. The media really has an interest <laughs> in selling newspapers or whatever, and you get a lot more traffic selling divisiveness than you do selling unity. Would you comment on that? 
You, you want me to? Yes. <laughs> uh, well, I think there's lots of uh, divisiveness out there, and it's not something created by the media. It may be amplified, and <clears throat> I think if, if there's a problem, it's often the tone of the coverage. But uh, in this uh, time we're having this panel discussion, <clears throat> this is really a pivot point in history for our country. This is a big deal, who President Trump is, what he's going to do. Last year, uh, I interviewed him with another reporter at the Post, and we addressed the question of power and quoted some of the things President Obama had said about power. And as you may recall, President Obama did not like war. He made it very clear in his first inaugural. He said, the power in the United States comes from our restraint and our humility. And we quoted this to Trump. And uh, I wish there were a video of it because he did not like the notions of restraint and humility. And so we asked, what, what do you think? And he said the following, I quote him directly. He said, real power is, I don't like to use the word, but real power is fear. And there is a lot of evidence that that's the way he operates, whether it works, whether you like it, whether you don't like it. Uh, it is a reality. And so the media uh, has a tricky job reporting on him. And I think some of it's been good. I think some of it makes it appear as if there is a jihad against him. And that's something we have to restrain ourselves in. Yeah. Sir? The only, other, the only other point I make is uh, I think the newspapers do a pretty good job. I start my day with six newspapers. It's television that is causing me distress in that uh, if you are, say, to the far right of our political spectrum, you'll watch Fox all day long and have your views reinforced. If you're to the left side, you'll watch MSNBC and have your views reinforced. Both of them are fighting for market share and for corporate profits. And we see it increasingly, they don't try to talk to each other. And our political leaders, especially in Congress, only follow that line, and they're not talking to each other. And so we could really do a lot if we could get, frankly, greater exchange of views among our politicians, and if we could get the media to do a better job of it. I find myself watching foreign media because I don't have to put up with the stuff that I see on American news shows. Bob, can I also um, but at the same time, um, you know, this is a remarkably resilient country, and all of these problems that we're facing now are not unlike problems that we have faced in the past. We just believe in our Constitution, believe in our people, and ultimately we will come through these, uh, these troubled times. The, for the young midshipmen and the cadets in the, in the room, I recommend that from the outset you read things that make you uncomfortable and that you may disagree with uh, because you have to expand your field of view. And if you only listen to that which makes you happy, uh, you're not doing those you lead a, uh, the service uh, that, that's expected of you. Final word. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. 11.30, right on the money. Thank you. 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 I enjoyed that. Enjoyed that very much. Thank you. Thank you. Corey, how are you? Sir, we got you out of here. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.